What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Jordan Cruz back here with the Country Roads webcast, and we have a very special treat for you today. You are going to be tuning in to our Country Roads conversation with former West Virginia running back number 33, Eugene Napoleon, who played for the Mountaineers from 1987 through 1989. But before we get into that, if you're watching on YouTube, just want to ask you to do us a quick favor here at the Country Roads webcast. Hit that subscribe button. It helps us. It helps you. It helps this Mountaineer football content get out to more Mountaineer Nation. And if you're listening on the audio side on the podcast, as always, subscribe to our YouTube as well. But be sure and uh, follow us on Twitter at WVU Country Roads. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and leave us a rating. That really helps. But you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever. And if you listen to the audio version, you prefer video version, we've got that up on our YouTube and it'll be up on our Facebook page as well at Country Roads Webcast. Um, that being said, let's get into it. Here is our Country Roads conversation with former West Virginia running back Eugene Napoleon. All right, Mountaineer Nation, welcome into our Country Roads conver- conversation. We are joined by the CEO of Nap Vision Entertainment, best-selling author. Uh, the list goes on and on of the things that this man has been involved with. And of course, you know, last but not least, former West Virginia running back, I'm sure, that's what you guys want to hear about, you know, some WVU stories and talk a little Mountaineers. Uh, West Virginia running back Eugene Napoleon played for the Mountaineers from 87 to 89. Really appreciate you joining the show today, Eugene. You doing all right? I appreciate you, man. I'm blessed. And thank you for having me on the platform. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're we're honored to have you on here. And uh, I know we want to get in some uh, WVU stuff, some W football talk. But before we get into that personally, you know, I was, you know, looking through your bio, you know, some things that you've done and what stuck out to me, something I didn't realize is you're also a best-selling author. I know I saw two of your books, uh, Dream Real and Reflections. Actually, you know, I haven't got a chance to read any of them, but I did add Reflections to my Amazon wish list, so I do plan on reading that. But uh, me personally, you know, I'm, I'm an aspiring writer myself, so that was very interesting to me, and I wanted to just kind of see if you have any other things in the works, you know, in that department as far as writing goes before we get into some West Jeff, Virginia stuff. I, listen, I appreciate it. Um... It's interesting because from a written standpoint, I am probably going to pen a third book. I'm going to let reflections kind of live a little bit longer Uh, right now. Let me see. I wrote that two years ago, and it's actually a motivational quotes book. So I'm a big quotes person, man. I I, I thoroughly enjoy a good quote. So I decided to do a 50 quote uh, book. So that's what reflection is. It's it's really uh, to help you build self-confidence, positive self-esteem some quotes to help you make better decisions. Uh, that's what that premise is all about. But I am going to pin a third one. Uh, that's, that's you know, God willing, that that's my plans. Probably within the next year or so, I'll release a, you know, a third book. But um, it's interesting when you talk about writing. You know, I'm in partnerships with so many different facets of that part of the business from a literary standpoint, also from you know, uh, movies, films, documentaries, when you write the storyboards and you write the actual scripts for these things. So it's interesting that you say that. Um, it's such a, an interesting world uh, when you deal with different people who come from that background. They're so creative in how they put things together. Um, oh, yeah. It's amazing to see the finished product. So that's why for me, writing has become real therapeutic over the years. You know, I do enjoy a good written piece. So uh, I'm looking forward to, like I said, broadening the horizons and, and, and putting out more product. You know, my wife, uh, God bless her, man. You know, she's involved in, in two movies now that were well written by some tremendous writers. Um, that stuff is it, it's just it's awesome. You know, it's a different lane, but um, it's an awesome lane to be in. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I, I couldn't agree more. It's just it's amazing because, you know, just everything starts from, a, you know, a blank white page, whether it be a book or a, or a film or whatever. And to see it come from, you know, just that concept, thoughts and someone said to be visualized on the screen or to a to a book that, you know, people can enjoy whatever medium it is. It's it's a beautiful thing. It really is art, you know. Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And I'll say this, you know, it's funny um, when you talk about the different art forms that, that's out. Talent is talent. It doesn't matter where it comes from, what the background is. The key is if you're going to be successful in anything, the completion of the task is really what the goal is. I don't you can make it as simplistic or as broad as you mm-hmm. want. But mm-hmm. if you can complete the, the the task at hand, it's going to allow you to be successful. So I love that whole premise, that whole concept as well. You have a, a, a an idea that starts in your head and you can put, you know, pin the pad and finish it. Listen, 
what you do from that point forth, you're successful in completing that thought process from this was a conceptual idea up here to me now writing it and, and really making it come full circle. That's some good stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It really is. It really is. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, some things that you're doing, you know, now and everything. But I think you know, kicking it back to when it all started before that, you know, had to start somewhere. And uh, mm-hmm. for you, you know, back at you were a Mountaineer. But before that, you were at the uh, the other score ac- across the border there at Pitt. And so, uh, you know, it, that, that is it is what it is. But, no, I understand you were a, a very high, highly sought after recruit and uh, had your had your choices of, school, of schools coming out of high school as a very talented running back. So uh, just what went into the not only the decision to choose Pitt, but also to lead you to West Virginia uh, in the future after that? Definitely. I appreciate the question. Well, um, that started, the Pitt situation started when I was seven years old. I told my mom at at seven I was going to Pittsburgh. And it was because I was a huge Tony Dorsett fan. So he was my sports hero. Uh, My mom was my, that's my hero, hero. But sports wise, it was Tony Dorsett. So I remember watching him play against uh, Notre Dame. And he was ripping Notre Dame up, had over 300 yards, few touchdowns. And I'm screaming and yelling that that's where I want to go to school. I want to be just like that guy. So my mom comes running out the kitchen and, and, and she's like, what's going on? So I told her what my aspirations were. And one thing about my mother, God bless her, she would never allow me to say something if I didn't have a blueprint or an idea of how to accomplish what I was actually saying. So her thing was, okay, well, you say you want to go here. How are we going to get there? You know, I'm seven years old living in the projects in Jersey City, New Jersey, Marion Garden Projects. How are we going to get there? So she sat down with me and we literally mapped out <laughs> from that conversation what the blueprint would be as far as being the best student that you have to be to get into college. Right. The hard work that it takes to be a true student and then a true athlete. What it's going to take to 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 be the best football player you can possibly be. We sat down and talked about all of that. And my mom, mind you, was not so much into sports as much as she was into let's cultivate and develop the dream that my son just told me he wants to live let's how do you make that dream a reality so it started at seven that i wanted to go to to pittsburgh because of me watching tony dorsett you know on tv um and it just so happened that i wound up going to a high school you know my high school coach was frank argiulo who's also our building's principal at st joseph's of the palisades back then. And he told me my freshman year when we first met that if you do everything you're supposed to do, by the time you are a senior, every university in the country will know who you are. And I thank God for exactly that being the case. You know, I worked hard. I did what I was supposed to do in the classroom. I did what I was supposed to do on the field. Uh, Shout out to Tom Lemming, because Tom Lemming uh, took a look at me when I was probably going into my junior year and then into my senior year. And Tom, for those who don't know who he is, is probably the Mel Kuyper of high school sports. You know, Tom Lemming is is a sports analyst who looks at all the top players around the country. And back then he was the one who would help to pick the high school Americans. So going into my senior year, I was a high school American, you know, considered on seven different teams. You know, uh, number one in the state of New Jersey, number three on the entire East Coast and the 13th best player in the entire country coming out of St. Joseph's High School. So, yeah, I could have went to any school in the country. But like I said, my dream school since I was seven was Pittsburgh. So that's what I wound up doing. I took all my my official visits, visited Oklahoma and all these other places. But um, I wound up going to Pitt. And uh, unfortunately, the death of my oldest sister at the time during my freshman year pretty much changed the whole trajectory of my mindset while I was at Pittsburgh. Uh, I was one of three freshmen who did not get redshirted at Pitt. So I made the travel team as a true freshman and all that good stuff. But the death of my older sister, the way it was handled, changed my whole uh, concept of, of in reality as to me staying at Pitt. That was the catalyst. Her death was the catalyst as to why I transferred. So I took five more visits. And of course, during that time, West Virginia was one of my five official visits once I decided to transfer. And I, listen, I lie to you not. Hindsight is 2020. Um, 
if I would have visited West Virginia out of high school, I can honestly say I probably would have attended WVU right out of high school because the transferring there allowed me to understand having to sit out that one year. It was one of the best moves of my young life to be completely forthright. Um, Don Neal and that staff provided something for me and my family that I really needed. And it was just the sense of being at home, the sense of the character and the moral base that Coach Nealon provided. The It's not just about sports. It was bigger than that. The atmosphere that he created there for the student athletes at that time was what I needed, especially after coming off of my sister's death. So I will say that to any parent who's listening. My going to West Virginia helped to shape and mold me from the same character and the same values that I was taught at home with my mom. For me, that's what I needed going to college. And when you're playing major college football, you have to find the right fit with the right type of individuals and coaches that's going to provide you that. That's what Don Neal and West Virginia and that in, that entire staff back then did for me. So it was the it was one of the best moves of my young life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that holds true today for for West Virginia is once the players get on campus for for the recruiting visits, that's when they they stand a good chance to land those players. And that's really always been a selling point, I think. And I'm sorry to hear about the circumstances that led you to transferring, but glad that you ended up as a Mountaineer, and um, we'll talk about the future in a minute, but I think, you know, just the teams that you were on, I know you touched on Don Neal a little bit and everything, we got to stick there in, you know, 87, 88, and I think you're a member of the, you know, the national team that played for the national championship in 88, and right. talking about that team a little bit, you know, um, one of the, you know, arguably the greatest team in NWVU history for sure, I think, WVU football history, and what Don Neal did turning that program around and getting it to that point, but going into that season, um, leading up to it. I just want to know what the kind of what the feeling was like. Did you guys know going in, hey, we got a chance to, to go undefeated and we may end up, you know, playing for the national championship. Did you guys know that ahead of time? I'll be honest with you. Absolutely. Um, I believe, well, first off, that year, during the offseason, we had such great leadership. You know, the seniors were just, I mean, second to none. The hard work that you put in and the preparation that we put in, we kind of knew we had a chance to be a really good football team. But everybody stayed that summer to 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 work out and to train and to put in the extra time needed and necessary to be that good. And you got a chance to see in camp what type of team we had. We had a loaded roster from top to bottom on both sides of the ball, offense and defense. And it's interesting because – Coach Nealon and that staff did a great job of not allowing us to overthink anything. So, for instance, we kind of had a good feeling that we were going to be good. After the third or fourth game of the regular season, I lie to you not, in our heads, we knew we had a shot to go to, to, be, to go 11-0 and, 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 and to have an undefeated season. But here's where having a great head coach and a great staff pays big dividends. He never allowed us to read our press clipping, so to speak. He never allowed us to get ahead of ourselves and, and, and not to look at each opponent, each individual week, week. That's what it was. It was that that opponent for that particular week. That was it. We didn't look ahead and we didn't look past anybody. And it takes a good coach and a good staff to do that. And that's exactly what he did. We were prepared to play every game, every week, as if it was the only game on the schedule. And I give all credit, you know, obviously to, to Coach Neal and that staff and to my teammates. Like I said, from top to bottom, this is why I'm wearing this shirt, team. Teamwork, there's no I in team. Serious teamwork. Could you imagine sitting in a running back room where all the running backs are as equally as talented as the next, but you understand we are here for a, a much greater purpose. It's not about individual stats. Of course, you want to rush for 100 yards a game. But when you got three to four equally talented backs, plus the best individual player in the entire country in Major Harris. So that equates in carries as well on offense. Forget about it. No one was worried about getting a thousand yards because you knew 
everybody was going to carry the ball X amount of times a game. No one back was going to get more than 20 carries a game. It's just that simple. But again, team, the team was far greater than anybody individual stats. And I love that philosophy. And again, that's something that was fostered by a great coaching staff that understood the importance of uh, hitting that that singular goal of going undefeated and, and having a chance to play for a national championship. Absolutely. I think that that speaks to, you know, like you said, the staff and just Don Nealon, how he went about building that roster very, very meticulously. And, you know, it's something that, that took time. You know, West Virginia was kind of down when he came in and it took time for him to get to that point. And I bring that up just to say, uh, to compare that to kind of where West Virginia is now, because I'm of the mind, you know, um, just as a fan that I've can kind of I've actually said in our, in our intro to our show, it has some our podcast that has some clips of, you know, things, you know, we've we said. And one of the things that I've got in their clip that I said is he is the modern day Don Nealon, because that's just kind of how I felt about Neil Brown and hearing people talk about him, that the comparisons have been made. And it's kind of uh, he's had, had caught got the program in a, in a, in a similar state when uh, Neil Brown took over. Scholarship numbers were down, you know, had a rough, you know, go and trying to build it up. And so I just wanted to ask you as someone who played for uh, Coach Nealon and I'm sure knows Coach Brown as well, um, do you see the comparison there in, in their style and, and the way that they're having to go about it? I definitely do. Um, I, I go I follow Coach Brown when he was at Troy. Um, he's a character man. You understand? So when you are a character guy, that means you're going to probably hire people that are like minded. That means you're probably going to bring in student athletes that are like minded. Um, and sometimes that's what Coach Nealon was. You know, he would sit you down and tell you exactly what his blueprint was and how you fit into that blueprint. Not necessarily promising you you're going to be the greatest thing since air. But at the end of the day, if you worked hard, you kind of understood, again, where you fit. That's important because I, I think Neil Brown in this current atmosphere of, of, of big time college sports and recruiting. You got to be brutally honest with the parent and with the student athlete. Coach Nealon was nothing but brutally honest with me when I, when he recruited me, you know, eons ago, I respected that. You understand? So to, to, to hear, I was on a, a zoom call a few months ago with coach Brown and had the chance to listen to his philosophies and, 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 and his recruiting uh, philosophy. And let me tell you something. It's eerily similar to the kind of man that Coach Nealon was way back when. That's what you need to run your program. You know, obviously, you know, everybody wants to win, win, win. You win with character. You win with character. And that's what he's recruiting. He's trying to recruit character. Yeah, sometimes it takes a lot longer to do that. Let me say this on your platform. People know me that know me well know that I'm not a stars guy. I don't get caught up in all the hype of five star, four star, three star, whatever. Right. There's so many people who don't really understand that systematic way of bringing in 25 stars. There's a reason why other programs can get those type of kids. We don't do the things that other programs do to get those type of kids. And that, again, is a reason why I respect what West Virginia does and how we've always conducted ourselves as a flagship university with doing things the right way. OK, so when you have a guy like a Neil Brown at the helm, he's going to recruit the right type of young people that's going to come to Morgantown and represent that flying WV in the right way. And if you don't want to be there, then you don't come to Morgantown, West Virginia. It's as simple as that. With me, I'm one of them, what you see, what you get type people. That's how I feel about it. Don't come and tear down the reputation of what the Mountaineers has built over all these years. And I'm glad that coach Brown is recruiting the right type of young people to come into this fine university. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think the culture is, is very important. Like you said, maybe more so that, you know, chemistry and culture and, you know, is more important than the stars and the talent that you can get. And like you said, when you spoke about, you know, coach Neal and he made it feel like a family and that was a, a big part of it. And I think coach Brown strives for that as well. And, you know, that's one thing to look at, especially coming up with this year's team is it's going to be his fourth year. So you're looking at a roster that's mainly his players, got a couple holdovers from the previous regime, regime, but that culture is almost fully installed. And that kind of makes me want to ask you 
a question in regards to transfers. I know you were a transfer yourself, transfer portal nowadays. It's a bit different game and stuff like that. But uh, as far as the culture and Neil Brown trying to install that uh, without, you know, I'm not saying specific people or it's, it's this case in every scenario, but do you think some of the transfers that have left the program could be them in a way addition by subtraction, maybe some guys that he inherited didn't fit the culture, but he had to, you know, take them on because he really didn't have no choice, you know, but to just make do with what he had versus now where he can kind of be more selective of the players that he wants to fit his culture. And that could possibly be a reason some of the players that have transferred have done so. That's a, that's a great question. Well, here's the thing. I think the transfer portal a, as it stands, this is, this is the free agency model of the NFL. <laughs> so yeah. this is the business of where we are in major college sports across the board, not just in football, but basketball and everything else in, in between. So you can't have it both ways. For instance, if you get kids that are coming in the transfer portal from from, you know, you know, uh, big universities or whatever the case may be, and they're adding to your roster and they're in, in your B, in the, it's a benefit to you. Then you're excited. Well, it works the opposite way as well. So when people go out the door, that's the nature of what's going on with this transfer portal. Um, I think. Coach Brown understands that, and I think every coach in America understands that it's the same exact thing. You got players leaving Alabama. You got players leaving Georgia. You got players leaving Miami. You know what I mean? So this is what every program is dealing with. I think the microcosm of what's happening in Morgantown, it seems to be more because we don't typically when you get to WVU, it, it's been such over the years where you don't leave. It was very minimum transfers before this point. You, we had kids who didn't like certain things. But I think that's part and parcel based on how they're recruited as well. And that's what I mean by the whole star mentality. You come in thinking that because you were good in high school, you're going to be good uh, on a major college level. It's all about consistency. It's all about growth and consistency and development. So I think that's part of the problem, too. You get a kid that comes in and maybe he doesn't fit the scheme. Maybe he thought, you know, uh, he came to college and this is what it was and you grow into that to understand that, wow, maybe this is not the fit. I'm all for if it's not the fit, go where you think it's going to be a better fit. Howsoever, because of the transfer portal being in its nature, the way that it is, and you got now, obviously, guys can go and <laughs> get these endorsement opportunities or whatever. That speaks a little bit differently as well. Where I have a problem with our transfer portal and the way it's set up, you come to a school like WVU when you are a starter, let's say a two-year starter, and then all of a sudden you get into your junior or senior year and somebody is whispering in your ear, well, if you go over here, you're going to get bigger endorsement opportunities. You're a two-year starter, two-year letterman at a, at, a, at a major Power 5 school. There will be no reason for you to go anyplace else because that means the development part of you has already been established. You're a two-year starter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So... There's something else that's driving, I think, players into these other situations. And again, it's not just a West Virginia thing. You, you see kids leaving all over the country for different reasons. I'm going to say this, and, and NCAA may, may or may not like it. If you really want to slow down the process of what's going on, I've said this uh, on another platform before, tie in the educational component to it, and I guarantee you it'll slow down the transfer portal about 60%. And what I mean by that is, for you to be eligible, if you can leave. You can definitely leave whatever school you want to. But in, in order to be immediately eligible at your next stop, you have to have a 3.0 GPA. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that would do it. That would do it. Yeah, you have to have a 3. Because here's the thing. We forgot what this whole thing is supposed to be about. It's not athlete-student. It's student-athlete. So where is the student component tied into the transfer portal? You get the immediate benefit as an athlete if you go from one place to the other, correct? You get the immediate benefit on stepping on the field as soon as you get there. Well, where's the academic side? I don't hear anybody talking about the academic side. So if you really want to put a hold on everybody flying all over the country and leaving here, there, there, okay, let's tie that component in. If you have a 3.0, it will allow you to be immediately eligible to step on the field at Place number two. If you don't have a 3.0, you can still go to the school, but you won't be eligible until you reach a 3.0. I guarantee you that will slow down the transfer portal. 
No, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, we when we've talked about NIL, you know, previously we mentioned that it's almost, you know, gotten to the point where with all this going on right now that you forget that these are students, you know, and it's not just sports going on. It's it's gotten to that point almost. And we even mentioned with, you know, guys that you're getting these guys, these big time transfers that are getting reported one million, two million dollar deals. How long is it going to take for the school to say you're make you're making two million dollars? Why do we need to offer you a scholarship? You can obviously afford to pay to go to this school, you know, or, or something like that. Because I think, I think, like you said, that, that the athlete part is definitely taking precedence right now over the student side. And that needs to kind of come back the other way a little bit for sure. And I think, you know, NIL, it's a good thing. You know, I, when I first heard, I was like, okay, the players, they probably deserve that, but also it's opened up a whole nother can of worms and you know, other ideas and stuff that I don't think we were expecting looking at it from a purely West Virginia standpoint, you know, you mentioned, you know, players, you know, two-year letterman at schools going to the other schools. And I think that's something you run the risk of right now with this, if it's NIL transfers for NIL purposes, because you're going to have the higher tier schools rating right the lower tier um, group of five rating right FCS, you know, what have you, just everyone down the line. It's And in, in that in turn is going to affect everything else, high school recruiting and what have you. But looking at it from West Virginia standpoint, do you think that West Virginia is kind of in a danger zone right now with this NIL if they can't, find ways to finance more deals for these players, for them getting picked off by other schools? Or what are, what are your thoughts on the NIL Absolutely. and when it comes to Absolutely. West Virginia? Absolutely. Unfortunately, now you're talking about something totally different than what West Virginia is used to, is accustomed to even talking about. You're talking about a different business model. That's really what you're talking about. It's a different business model. So now you almost have to be, you know, you're almost forced to bring in a consultant. You're almost mm -hmm. forced to bring in a business consultant, a, a, a firm or a team of people that will now say, let us only focus on getting you these type of endorsement opportunities off the field in order to counteract what some other major university might be doing, because they may <laughs> they, they may be doing that. Who knows? But my point is, you're talking about a totally separate business model that we're not accustomed to operating under, whereas there may be other institutions who've been doing this for a much longer period in time than we have, even before this whole NIL. So that's something, and, and again, I can speak to that again, being so highly recruited, I understood the difference between, you know, universities that were not, uh, I was a national recruit. So therefore, when I took my visits to these big programs, I understood the difference between going to a smaller program and understanding they didn't have the same catalyst or the same opportunities marketing wise than these other bigger programs. So that's going to be something that we're going to have to take a look at. I would imagine the administration at WVU to see how could you bridge the gap because there has to be a balance. Anything in life is a balance. Whenever it is, you know, whenever it's like this, there's a problem. So there has to be a balance and we have to figure out how do we fit in finding that balance at West Virginia? Cause you're right. If not, that's going to be the thing. That's going to be the calling card. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if parents are asking that question now. Oh, well, we know so and so went over here and they offered him this already. Uh, what do you guys offer? You know, in, 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 you know, on that level, Are you guys offering is my son going to make half a million dollars in endorsement opportunities by the time he's a sophomore? It's a legitimate question, because I'm sure everybody else is, 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 is asking that of these other schools. Yeah, and I, th I think one of the major detractors of it, especially from West Virginia standpoint, is how the university is not the ones that's tied into the players getting their, you know, the NIL money. It's, you know, from outside companies, outside sources is where it has to come from. So in West Virginia's ca case, like they've created the country, you know, a group, Ken Kendrick, Oliver Luck, they created the Country Roads Trust, which is a great thing I think can help West Virginia. But then you also run into the to the problem of the limited, mo the limited amount of money you know, people that are donating to the university, even if you have a big donor, let's say this big donor is donating a million dollars to the Mountaineer Athletic Athletic Club, but does he have enough to to donate a million to the Country Roads Trust as well? Or then are you then splitting it? You know, he's donating 500K to each organization. And are you kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul when it comes to that without the universities being tied in? And again, it's a business model. You got to figure out like that's a again, that's a great point of reference. What's what will then be the business model that we have to adhere to? And, and, and how does that look? You know what I mean? When you really sit down, how many players do you have at the table that's going to pour into, you know, uh, to, to create that that flow of money? And I just think right now 
those are real difficult questions that we have to answer because that's going to be either the reason why we get players or the reason why we lose players to other institutions who are doing those things. Right. Absolutely. It's it's big for, you know, college football is kind of in a fragile state right now with all this happening right at once. And that's kind of a you know big picture look at it. But uh, we're looking ahead, you know, West Virginia, you know, next season, as we mentioned, Neil Brown's fourth season, um, getting ready to start spring football here before long. But just kind of wanted to get your, you know, brief thoughts. I know I won't keep you too too much longer here. Brief thoughts about the upcoming West Virginia football season and uh, this upcoming team, you know, with Graham Harrell taking over as the new offensive coordinator. Neil Brown went out and made it, the changes that I think were necessary to try and improve the offense and wanted to get your thoughts on, on that as well as, you know, the quarterback battle West Virginia is going to have, you know, one of the most recently, I think 2013 was the last time we really probably had a legit quarterback battle. So, you know, almost a decade since you've had one like this and you've got three guys competing that have never started a game before. So just kind of want to get your thoughts on the upcoming look of the Mountaineer football team and specifically the offense, which is the area that needs the most improvement. I think we could all agree. Definitely. I think Graham Harrell was an excellent uh, hire. Um, I think him being able to come in and, 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 and usher in something new offensively is going to help. I think we have three talented QBs in that room. And here's what I will say about starting a, a, either one of them will be the fir a first time starter, as you just stated, you know, at this level. So which means you're going to have to live with the mistakes. Right. That's part of the game. You're going to have to live with, with with this individual's mistakes. Now, with that being said, do I think we have enough talent to. Because you have a first year starter at QB and you live with those mistakes, do we have enough talent to win? The question would be, do we have enough talent offensively to win at least seven to eight games, right? Mm -hmm. And that's with a new offensive coordinator, new philosophy, the whole nine, plus a new starting quarterback. A lot of times those things are hard to come from underneath of. Do we have the ability to do that? I really believe Coach Brown's fourth year going in. If you look at his track record, he's always turned the corner within year two or three, right? Um, this is going to be interesting because it's his first year, like you said, with his full Monty of who he brought in. Um, I'm looking forward to a successful year for West Virginia football. I'm looking forward to really good play at the quarterback position. I'm looking forward to making the adjustments up front on the offensive line that needs to be made in order to be consistent with a good running game that's then going to help a young quarterback that's going to help nurture bringing in a new, you know, Graham system on offense. All those things are going to have to connect. And we need to start to see that hopefully in, you know, in spring ball and then the spring game and then through camp before the season starts. And I'm hoping that the maturation clicks by game two or three. The first game, it's always one of them things you just don't know. But I'm hoping by week two or three, you start to see our offense clicking more consistently on all cylinders. Because if you don't have that, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I don't think, and I, listen, I blue, I, I bleed, you know, gold and blue. That's my favorite combination colors. In my guest room, it's all gold and blue. It's all West Virginia. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, same, you know, same. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So nothing goes in my guest room that's not West Virginia or gold and blue. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I want to see us in that eight, nine game win column. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um but I just know that we're going to have to be a little bit more patient as fans. And I know people are saying, ah, what do you mean patient as fans? This is fourth year. We supposed to. You got to relax a little bit because Coach Brown is building a culture here that is his culture. So it's kind of like you had to flush out the old regime to bring in your new stuff. I'm anxious mm -hmm. to see with the higher of, of, of coach Graham and these talented quarterbacks where that goes. So I'm going to get on your platform and say this. I'm going to predict that we win eight games. Oh, I love it. I love and it. you can hold, you can hold me to it. And I'm going to predict that any one of those three quarterbacks will probably be, and you're going to think I'm crazy. 
newcomer of the year in the Big 12. Wow. Wow. I, be, I believe it. No, he's had success with young quarterbacks. So I, th I think that yeah, that's that's what helps. I think I was a little bit more leery of it before before they hired him. And then now I, I, I feel comfortable with where they're at. Yeah, we have a lot of talent in that room. Those young men are talent. All, all of them, each to their to their own different styles of playing the position. But they're all talented and they're young. That's where I inspire to say. I think with, with 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 coaches' philosophy of how to bring along young quarterbacks, it plays right into our hand of any one of the three having an opportunity to be successful early. But I also think it's going to rely on what we have up front. We're going to have to play a lot more consistently and a lot better up front. Yep. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. You got to see improvement from that offensive line. I think. That they've, they've done it the right way. They've got the numbers now in the trenches because you don't want to build from the trenches out. And defensive line has not been a problem. They have a ton of numbers there. The offensive line was very young last year, and you got the same guys together. So you're hoping that with all the time they've played together now that they'll start to gel. And like I said, like I said, it's a lot of new pieces all around with the quarterback and Graham Harrell and stuff. So like you said, it might take some time. But I'm kind of in the same mind of you. I've got a lot of faith in this, this team this upcoming year. I think the defense has been solid. And if the offense can improve, West Virginia has been – in most games with the chance to win it at the end. Just got to get over right. that hump. And once you do that, then, you, you know, you're in good shape. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So that being said, uh, really appreciate you coming on for this Country Roads con conversation here on the Country Roads webcast. Um, before I let you go, I know you have uh, you have your own you, uh, spot there on YouTube. I know you're on the Sports Illustrated. But anything you want to plug there, you know, just let you have the floor there. Man, I appreciate you. Listen, I do have, and, and I thank God for it, Napoleon's Corner. It's on YouTube, but it's on the Sports Illustrated platform, as you just mentioned. Please go and like and subscribe. You know, I'm up every Wednesday at 7 p.m., and um, I really do appreciate it. It's just, uh, it, it, it's one of the shows where I'm just talking about different things, life, uh, some sports every now and again, more inspirational and motivational content. That's what Napoleon's Corner is all about. So please go on YouTube, like, subscribe to it. Uh, please share the link. I really will appreciate it. Like I said, it's every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I definitely want to give a shout out. I'll be remiss if I didn't to my beautiful wife. Uh, Grammy considered gold selling plat double platinum award winning recording artist is Tracy Napoleon. But her stage name is Naya N Y apostrophe A. And I want to give a shout out to my cousin. If you know anything about music, you will remember the legendary group from the 90s and early 2000s PM Dawn. Um, one of the most successful groups of all time. As a matter of fact, they have an upcoming uh, unsung uh, episode uh, in April. I believe it'll be sometime in uh, early April. Uh, it's on TV One, and it's the PM Dawn story, which um, I thank God that you know I'm featured in a little bit. My wife, my beautiful wife, is featured in it as well. So I'm going to also give a shout out to to my cousin Jared Cortez, you know, uh, slash Eternal. He's a tremendous writer, producer. And he's one of the founding members of PM Dawn. So he's the one that's the catalyst from all those hit big, big, multi freaking platinum hit records that they've had in the 90s and early 2000s. He's the catalyst to that. So he's producing my wife's EP now. And we currently have the number one single out right now. It's called Chilling With My Baby on all streaming platforms. You can you can purchase that yeah. and we would greatly appreciate it. Definitely, everyone go check that out. I think your track record speaks for itself that anything that you've got your hand in is is, is solid gold, uh, in, in literally in some cases, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, behind me speaks it. You know, there's two platinum Absolutely. records there and there's a gold album there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But that means I really appreciate you coming on here on the Country Roads webcast and uh, give us some time. We're honored to have you on and, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I'll be remiss without saying, you already know how I'm going to end this thing. Let's go Mountaineers. Absolutely. Let's go Mountaineers. You got it, brother. I don't want to see your face up close. I just want to get the grades. See, I'm in damage control. My